So um, getting started, um, first of all, I introduce myself. I'm Dr. Yasser Al-Khidr. I have an MDS or surgery in implantology and I have a PhD uh, in oral implantology from, um, uh, from China, actually from Wuhan, where all these things started, Hawaii University of Science and Technology. And I'm also a member of a few um, organizations, the ITI, the German, um, think the Korean Society of Radiology, Sudanese Association of um, Implantology, and the Saudi Association of Oral Periodontology. So what I'll be talking today, uh, I'll be talking about um, a new topic. Yeah, actually, it's a different topic. It's not clinical. I'm not going to be talking about clinical stuff. I'll be showing you all the relevant clinical things, but basically I'll be talking about more of more biology. So avoiding biological aging in titanium implants. So uh, what we need to, need to know is what is biological aging? And the other question I'm posting here is, can we achieve super os integration? First of all, if there's such a thing called super os integration, all of us, we know that we have os integration, but can we achieve super os integration? So this is the other question that I'm going to ask in here. And um, uh, it's sponsored by the AIM Academy. And let's get this started. And before we start our first topic in here, um, we need to ask ourselves a few questions. The first question is like, first of all, we need to know the biology. I mean, before we start doing our implants, um, we need to know the basics because the basic of implant dentistry is basically you need your implant to be so integrated. So if this is one of the basics of implant dentistry, you need to know the biology of that. If you know the biology of that, you know the, how the healing works and how if something wrong with the healing was going to happen, how can we, why is it slow? How is it, why is it um, um, fast? So we, I'm gonna talk about integration and about the phenomena of biological aging. I'm gonna show you this uh, in a few minutes and how to reverse it. And a few other concepts like photo functionalization, nano surface nano modifications, and then we talk about what super os integration. Um, to start with, let's start with the os integration itself because it's the basic of this lecture and the basic of implant dentistry in general. So, what is os integration? Um, according to this guy, very much everyone knows it's the direct connection between the Order leading one and the surface of the load bearing implant, uh, implant at the biological level. That means tissue level or cellular level. Uh, if you want to make it short, you can say just the functional and chirologist in the bone. Which means this piece of metal is attached to the bone, right? So that's just making it simple. But in order to understand the, the, the this thing, the integration, you need to know the biology. Basically, it's a biological thing. It's, uh, it's this thing happens at a cellular level. So I think all dentists, they need to know how does it happen. So first of all, we're going to talk about the biology and then we talk about the relevance of this to clinically into our implants. So the biology of, of integration basically is the, the process of process integration. Basically, it's an inflammatory, it's an inflammatory response to an induced injury, which means when you want to do an implant, when you want to place this implant, um, first of all, we need to prepare the bone, which is, we cut the tissue, that's an injury, that's an that's a induced injury. Then we drill the bone, that's another induced injury. That means we're gonna have, basically we're gonna have inflammation, um, right? The place is gonna be filled with blood, then we place our implant, then the implant will start be um, covered with this blood, all the surface will be covered with the blood. So basically this is the first step, this is the first step of um, the osteointegration process. Uh, you made an injury, um, blood came out and attached to the surface. And uh, I mean, the blood I was uh, contact the surface. With this blood, you get an attachment of the serum proteins in the, uh, in the blood. So the serum proteins will start attaching to the implant surface. See the first um, process of the osteointegration process, okay? The first step. So what happens next is you get the platelets come and they start accumulating and degrading, a degradation of that, I mean, they accumulate and then they start the degradation. The places come because it's an injury, of course, it's just like any other injury, you have platelets here. These platelets, they start secreting different things like vasoactive amines, which um, uh, causes vasodilatation of the vessels. Uh, no, it's not vasodilatation. It makes them uh, more, um, the, uh, what do you call it? The permeability of the vessels increase. So now I get more things can go in and go out. And then they also secrete cytokines. Cytokines 
and inflammatory mediators, they, they start, this, this is the second stage, basically. The cytokines start calling other things like neutrophils, white blood cells. Neutrophils come before the other, the, the other white blood cells. They come within, they peak at around three days from the start of the injury. And then we also got osteogenic and endothelial progenitors. They start um, uh, coming, they I mean, the cytokine, they attract this. And after a few days, I mean, after the neutrophils, they come the macrophages. The macrophages is the whole process of inflammation and removing all the um, bacteria, the dead cells, the um, dead bone, whatever. So basically, it's a, a cleansing or a cleaning um, uh, process of the area. So once you have this, you got all the white blood cells. They clean everything. They kill all the bacteria. They clean and uh, and you got osteogenic and on, on endothelial progenitors came to the area. Then you have the next stage. The next stage, since we have these oxygenic and endothelial cells, the next stage will logically be the building up of the, um, the small blood vessels and the bone. So we have the osteogenesis, the, the osteogenesis phase, which is the third phase of osteointegration. It happens in, um, uh, simultaneously with the removal of the coagulum. So the, the, the coagulum starts removing, and then we have and your genesis starts coming, the new smaller blood vessels come, and this will act as a transportation for all the, um, all the other cells to reach to the implant surface. And after this, the cells, once they reach here, we have cell deposition, maturation, and mineralization. This will initiate the stage, the next stage of, of, of course, is the osteogenesis uh, process itself. And once you have all these um, progenital osteogenic cells started attaching to the surface, then you get the final stage, which is the bone remodeling and maturation. First of all, you have osteoid bone, we have cells with there is no mineralization around. And then after around two weeks or so, you get woven bone, which is a softer type of bone. And this woven bone, within the next three months, it gets replaced by lamellar bone, which is our final bone, which is the strong bone. Then we can load our implants. So basically, this is the, the like the cellular procedure or the cascade of events that happen when once you use the injury and you place your implant inside. So basically, the first step was protein absorption. And oh, by the way, I had to mention this because before I used to, uh, I was confused a little bit between the adsorption and the absorption. Absorption is not need to get the stuff absorbed inside or something, but this one is a D, it's adsorbed to the surface. So anyhow, first thing is protein absorption, inflammation stage, possibly you need to start, and then bone remodeling and maturation. So this is the cascade of the chain of events, or the cascade of events that happen, uh, and we'll call it oxygen. So what's the relevance of this to my practice? Why do I need integration? Why do I care about integration? Authentication is the thing. When I was trying to write this slide, I was just going to mention so many things, but basically, I just concluded that it's the thing of, of everything. It's like the main thing in implant dentistry. So, if you have an implant here, if you make a quick comparison between implants and normal teeth, what is the major difference between these two? The major difference, of course, that we all know that it's a horizontal ligament. You have a horizontal ligament here, the teeth is attached to the horizontal ligament, and the other side, so that's good. It's a good thing. You have a cushion effect, and the other thing you also have increased blood supply to the area. So it is more prone, I mean, it can retain more um, occlusal pressure because of this small cushion effect. Another thing, it has more blood supply. It has a third um, source of blood supply than our implant. On the other side, you don't have this present ligament. The implant is attached to the bone directly which means we ain't got no periodontal ligaments, we ain't, we ain't got no more blood supply, um, just like the other side, which means the my implant, including the prosthesis, the whole thing depends on how well is this piece of metal attached to the bone. I'm gonna look at this quickly, and then just let it show that everything is okay. Um, this is my thing, okay, I think I think it's good one, okay. So it went again, it just went and everything as well. So, so it, it means that the, the, the implant, basically, the whole thing depends on how well is my implant attached to the bone, right? Which means if I don't have this, this integration, if my implant is not attached to the bone, 
that means no circulation, they have nothing basically. It's an infant cell, basically, it's not attached to the bone, it will just it will fall. Um, I cannot put a twist or a prosthetic part on something moving. Okay? So, uh, concluding that, what's the integration of the thing? So, let's talk a bit. I have one slide about implant failure. Let's talk about implant failure and the causes of implant failure in general. We have different causes, and it's not, I don't have time in this, we have like different, different, many implant uh, failure causes, but um, it's not like the subject of this um, or the topic of this lecture. So, I'm just going to go through this quickly. You can get surgical protocol failures in general, like a bad surgical protocols. You have loading failures, you have patient health. If anything will affect the patient's healing ability, um, it will um, it will affect my implant post integration, and therefore it will affect my it will just it might lead to implant failure. So um, smoking more than ten cigarettes, heavy smokers, implant characteristics characteristics of course the implant surface will affect my integration, and therefore it will affect the success of my implant or the predictability of success of my implant and also get infections and different things. But in general, you can just divide these. There, of course, there are many, many classifications, but we can also divide this into early and late, okay, in general. Um, mainly, the um, early ones are the biological, biological complications. Late ones, you can also have biological complications, but mainly they are mechanical complications or loading issues and stuff like this, so prosthetic things. So, um, Early complications, I just zoomed in this one because the reference on this, usually I don't concentrate on these references, but this one, I like the name. The, the name of the article was Implant Failure, a Dentist Nightmare, which is extremely true, by the way. It is a true name. It is a dentist nightmare. You put an implant, it fails, it's a nightmare for you and for the patient and for everyone. So, and it maybe gets like, I don't know, nightmares. <laughs> so, anyhow, so um, implants are supposed to be successful. Um, one of the, um, the previous researches, um, it's not one, actually a few previous researches, they concluded that peri-implantitis and lack of force integration are the major factors leading to implant failure. So most of the failures are just either force integration did not happen at all, or it happened, and then maybe you got an infection, and then you lost your also integration. Um, this is the main, main reason for implant failure, okay? Um, other reasons might be like a fractures in the prosthesis, mean fractures of the screws inside, fractures of the implant, which is very rare. But mainly, um, most roads, uh, most failures, they have um, an osteointegration integration loss factor. Okay, so basically, osteointegration integration failure. How do you, how do, how do you know it? You can get radiolucencies, any radiolucencies around the implant, between the implant and the bone, of course, you get, you, you, it's, it's an osteointegration integration failure. Maybe you get like mobility or loosening. We know that any sort of mobility in implant and tissue, it means um, it's a loose implant, which means you have to take it out or it's a failure as well. Sometimes you get like fibrous union, which is not osseointegration. integration. That's a fibro integration, which is also a failure because I need my implant to be attached to bone directly. And you get, if you get like pus, blood, pain on biting, all these are signs of a failing, failing also integration. It doesn't mean that it failed completely. Um, there is this classification of failing, there is an ailing implant. And a failing implant and a failed implant. So sometimes you can be failed in the middle and sometimes you, know, you can not. So basically, I have my property with an implant failure, but I wrote also integration failure. Why is that? Because actually also integration failure is an implant failure. If you have of integration, you don't have an implant, so you have to it up. So uh, you can have many ways, I mean, you can have different ways of failure. Um, it doesn't have to be um, uh, a full auto-integration failure, you can have like a partial auto-integration failure, that means you have a partial failure, like this case, or this case, this case. And this case is uh, like more severe situation here, and I think they have to remove it. But anyhow, this is just an example of failure of auto-integration. And then you can get like this, um, either it's favorable or not, that's um, subject to debate, but it's not the issue here. These are just um, pictures showing that the nightmare of, this is the nightmare of any dentist. You take an x-ray and you find something like this, it just feels bad. <laughs> so basically, also integration is the main thing. So if you do, if you do the math here, if also integration failure equals implant failure, and also, therefore, also integration success equals implant success, if you remove the failure and you put success. Therefore, enhancing osteointegration integration equals more predictability, 
and implant success rate. You have higher predictability rate and a higher success rate of all implant because they are just related to each other, also integration and implant success. So uh, what happens if you look, because uh, you know, most, uh, most clinicians actually who are doing just clinical work, they concentrate on the success of the implant doing, um, um, using many clinical procedures, modification of different new ways to manage the implant, soft tissue, hard tissue, um, the timing implant of time loading and placement, which is of course good. But if you look at that, the main thing, if you know that also integration success is implant success, and we try to concentrate on the also integration process itself, it means we can start from the roots and increase the predictability and the success rate of the implant, even before we start the clinical procedure. I mean, the rest of the clinical procedure. So that's about also integration. Now we know what's also integration and why is it so important. From here, we can know that what, hap can, can, what happens to also integration before we start our procedure? Can it be affected before I even place my implant? Yes, it can. That's why they found or they founded uh, the concept of biological aging of titanium surfaces, uh, something called like this. So before we start talking about the biological aging, uh, aging uh, let's just a quick note about titanium itself. We know that most of our implants are titanium. And uh, of course, some people use their conium and other things, but most implants are titanium. Right? So titanium is a biocompatible, highly biocompatible material. It has high mechanical stability, it high, has a high corrosion resistance, and it is a bioinert material. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know. It's a bioinert, which means no harm. It does not do anything bad to my bone, but on the same time, it does not do anything good to my bone. So it's just a scaffold or just a thing that does nothing and wait for the bone to attach to it. That means my osteointegration occurs due to lack of a negative response to, uh, from this negative response from my titanium surface. That means it's a bio unit, it doesn't do anything, neither good or bad. So this is actually what started people thinking, can you do anything about this? Can my implant surface have a positive response to the bone? So yeah, okay, so let's see that. So now we know a little about titanium. Let's talk about biological aging. And even before we talk about biological aging, let's talk about aging in general. So if you have a person like this, aging happens to anything, any person, any living organism, whatever. Anything ages in general by time is the time of it. So people age. If you see this guy after 10 years or 20 years, you have a like this. Even the surface of his skin has changed if you notice, yeah? More interest and you know, less quality and stuff like this. So people eat. What, what happens if you have an apple? Does it taste? Yes, it does. What happens if you put an apple for a week in the shelf? You have someone sleep like this. So now we know that apples age as well, right? So people eat. Um, fish age. What about metal? Can metal age? Well, uh, yeah. Theoretically speaking, they don't age, but they are aging by, I mean, time has an effect on metal. If you get, if you throw this piece, this coin at the bottom of the sea, for example, or just leave it outside somewhere in a humid place for a long time, what happens to it? Um, it becomes oxidized like this, you have these green things, and then you have to um, start to clean the surface again to get this shining, uh, the shininess back. So yes, they do age. So now we're talking about metals. What about this? Does it age or not? What about implant surfaces? This is the question which was on the mind of Takahiro Ogawa. This is the Japanese um, scientist, he's a professor, and he was thinking about um, do implants age or not? And actually he wrote a few articles about this. And this main idea came from the notion of um, um, uh, um, BIC, the bone to implant contact. He noticed Takahiro Ogawa, he noticed that, you know what, once a bone, attaches to the implant surface, there is something called the BIC, the bone to implant contact, they measure it by percentage, how much bone is actually attached to the, um, the surface. And he found that only 55, uh, once you put the implant, only 55% of this bone is attached to the implant surface. So you're like, why is this happening? Why am I, is, uh, I mean, screwing my implant inside and only 55% is attaching to the surface, which is this part exactly. So the bone attachment, to the uh, metallic surface. Can we increase this or not? 
So then they studied these um, surfaces of implants and they found out that actually implant surfaces age. And they gave a definition of biological aging is the time related degradation of the physiochemical properties of the implant surface. So basically, your implants they have um, uh, the, the, a degradation in their properties. Uh, it's not the same. You have an implant, a new implant, it has different properties than an old implant. So it has one of the different properties. It, first of all, it, it loses hydrophilicity, which is the surface uh, energy, you can say. It loses, it, there's a shame in the surface charge, I'm going to show you now, um, from plus, or ne plus and negative, and, and, I mean, negative and positive. And then you get hydrocarbon accumulation on the surface of the implant, which covers our surface. So now we know the problem. Why did it change? Why do we have less bone to implant compact, uh, contact uh, in regards to the um, difference between new implants and old implants? So we are thinking, okay, now we know the problem. How to solve it? He had an idea, hmm, like this, but his idea was not looking like this lamp. It was actually a blue one. It was looking more like this blue light. You are thinking, you know what? What happens if we get a UV, uh, UV light, like UV radiation, and if you put it on the implant surface, what will happen? Then they discovered that there is a specific wavelength of this UV light. It's uh, a UV, UV light by C, which is between 10 and 290 nanometers. And this specific 256, that was the golden number for him is considered superior in vertebral, it reduces the surface carbon level, it improves the hydrophilicity, and it enhances the protein absorption and cell function, which basically reverses the process of aging. It just reverses everything and brings my implants back to get as new, and you know what, in fact, even better than the new one. Yes, it is, I'm going to show you right now. How is it? So that takes us to the next um, uh, topic, which is photo functionalization, which is actually UV photo functionalization. This is the name of the procedure when he uses um, this UV light to uh, heat the surface of the implant. Uh, so, photo functionalization is the of biological agent. Uh, it has many effects, physiochemical, biological, and um, clinical effects. So, let's start with the physiochemical effects on the implant surface itself. So. The physiochemical effect is going to be on the implant surface because actually the UV light, you expose the, UV, the, the implant surface to the UV light and then you put it into someone's mouth. So if you have one implant like this and one of the size was as received, which is the normal one that we use daily, and the other side was a photo functionalized using UV light, we, put, we apply UVC light on the surface. What are the differences? First of all, um, let's look at the hydrophilicity of the surface. Um, Water functionalized surface show much higher rotability across the implant surface than the as received surface, which is the normal surface, the non photo functionalized surface. So, the surface, once you put your UV light, it becomes super hydrophilic. What did this mean, super hydrophilic? And why would I even want to know this? Does this affect me clinically or not? Or is it just a theoretical thing? It does affect you. So, this is the normal drop of blood when it touches the implant surface. And they actually measure it by like, uh, if you can follow my mouse here, this angle between the implant surface and the, the, the drop of blood, they actually measure it like 90, 45, um, whatever. Uh, so if the angle here is less than five degrees, they call the surface uh, super hydrophilic. You don't have, you don't have a, an, a, a, an angle like this. So an angle of attachment between the blood and the surface of the implant is less than five degrees. So there is a high surface energy of this implant or this uh, metal I have here. Uh, it is much more hydrophilic and in fact, it's super hydrophilic. If you look at a clinical photo or a pre clinical presentation of this, this is an as received implant. If you put a drop of blood or in this case, I think it's just um, red colored, I don't know. Uh, and this is another one. Once you put the same three drops in here, it absorbs the, 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 the fluid or the blood in uh, significantly, significantly higher um, rate than the other one. So there is much more absorption on this side. If you want to look an to another clinical picture like this one, look at this. This is just by touching the implant to the, um, 
hit the surface of the, um, just before placing the implant itself. And here, as soon as you touch it, if you have this photo-functionalized surface, you get this high blood absorption, quick and high absorption, which means the blood will attach. We know that this is the first, the first uh, stage of um, our ocean integration process, the blood attachment. Now you have a very high rate of blood attachment, a very quick one to the most of the surface. Okay? So that's the first effect. So now I initiated my super, my ocean integration more quickly and I suffered more surface. I have more protein absorption on this side. So the other effect here is the electrostatic status of the surface. How would this affect my implant? Okay. We all know that cells and proteins are negatively charged inside the body. Okay? So that's one thing to know. So here, uh, I mean, if you look at the implant surface, um, we have cells that are negatively charged, and we have an implant surface which is negatively charged. What happens that, uh, if you do UV photofunctionalization of the other surface is that this surface will become positively charged. The surface suddenly change from minus to plus, to from a negative charge to a positive charge. So now I have my negatively charged cell trying to attach to the surface on a normal situation. They can't because you have a negative and a negatively charged surface as well. So you need something in between, like a carrier in between. You have to depend on magnesium, calcium, I don't know, um, potassium, so all these things to take you and attach you to the implant surface. And if you look at this just quickly, these colors, so you got blood, osteoblasts, albumin, and cations, monovalent or divalent. And you got the purple ones are hydrocarbons. ones. So here it's a negative and a negative. They cannot attach directly. You need something in between for your cells to attach to the surface. What happens if I do photofunctionalization, if I apply UV light on the other surface? So if you do this, now you have a negative and a positive, which means your cells and your albumin, your proteins will directly attach. It doesn't need any other carrier, nothing in between. They directly start attaching to the surface, which means um, more attachment and faster attachment of your proteins, which is the first step of auto-integration, as I showed you before. So that's the second step of UV photofunctionalization. The third one is the hydrocarbon. Hydrocarbons, if you look down here, it's the purple one. So what are hydrocarbons? Actually, hydrocarbons is the thing, is the, is the thing that started all these issues. All, all the implant surfaces are covered by hydrocarbon layers, and these hydrocarbons, what we do using photofunctionalization are all removed. So if you look at here, you got the um, cell attaching, you got half of the surface um, uh, filled or occupied by these hydrocarbons, and once you do the photofunctionalization, it's a clean surface. You don't have this anymore. You have more area for the attachment of your cells and proteins. That means more DIT, more bone things on contact. Everything starts attaching. You have more surface for everything to start attaching here. That means you have more attachment of and big start and build up of uh, the bone. So that's what the third effect. So you have enhanced protein absorption, but attachment is spread of osteoblast. It's a clean surface. Okay. So that was about the physiochemical effect of photofunctionalization. And by the way, this is not like rocket science or something sci-fi or whatever. They already even did I oh I think I saw a machine. They have like small devices where you can put the implant, you apply it for just a few minutes, you put the TV really light, and then you take it and put it into the patient's mouth. It's a massive effect and of the on the predictability of the, the whole procedure. So you have hydrocarbon, you have electrophilic status, you have hydrocarbon. Okay. Next is biological effect, which is the indirect effect. You don't apply UV light on the cells directly, you apply it for the direct effect was on the surface of the implant. So what's the indirect effect? So you do have a direct any direct effect on the um, on the cells. So if you say that we have an So you know that it's mainly uh, composed of collagens and fibrinectins. And we have the cell that wants to attach to the um, extracellular matrix. And many of these cells want to start attaching, migrating, adhesion to the surface of the implant. So I have many cells are coming in and they're ready to work. So what we have is integrin is the main source, of, like the main method of attachment of the cells to the um, extracellular matrix is integrin. 
Um, uh, it's an extracellular matrix collagen and fibrin actin interacts with the transmembranous integrin. So that's the first thing. Integrin, they connect with this extracellular matrix to the vincolin, which is another protein inside the cell. Um, vincolin will attach to actin. Vincolin and actin are the most important um, uh, proteins we were looking at when we were doing research because vincolin binds to integrins, actin, filaments in the major constituents of cytoskeletal and stress fibers. So basically what happens is um, this um, attachment to be, together will activate the cytoskeletal development, the development of my osteoblasts, okay? So these cytoskeletal stress fibers will then become activated once I have this uh, chain. Um, the stress fibers um, will be activated. And these stress fibers, why do I need them? Because I need them to, 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 to create my uh, um, philopodia and lamellopodia, which is the same function, but like a thinner um, uh, inter uh, interjections. I don't know how to describe this. So I got like, um, uh, um, you know, <laughs> I'll show you later. So um, lamellopodia and philopodia, this, the aid in the movement, cellular migrations and spreading of the, it's basically there are projections for the spreading on the, on the titanium surface and they also for attaching to each other until the final bone will be formed, okay? So basically for this to develop, you need stress fibers. For stress fibers to develop, you need um, actin and for actin to start being activated, you need vincolin attachment to the integrin. So it basically is also a cascade or it was, it's a chain of reactions that will lead to migration, more migration, more adhesion and more spread of osteoblasts. Basically it's the cytoskeletal development of the whole thing, okay? So what is the effect of the UV functionalization? First of all, first effect, protein absorption. Um, previous researches, they found that protein absorption increases less than 50% in eight titanium surfaces. So if you have an old titanium surface, you have, uh, I just explained this, because just because of the hydrocarbon attachment and the different positivity, uh, the, the, the electric, uh, electric charge of the surface. So um, logically you have um, less protein absorption than a new surface. So basically uh, there is a difference between an old surface and a new surface. A difference between uh, if you have a, an implant which you just ordered an implant that was um, stored in a cabinet for a year, uh, yes, there is a different effect, different clinical effect. So we have, um, there are also other previous researches, they found that the lower hydrocarbons, you get more protein absorption due to the same reasons that these hydrocarbons occupy a lot of the surface of the old um, uh, implants. Therefore, when I use UV light, UVC to be specific, I have more protein expression even more than the new surfaces. Not just, it doesn't just renew or um, reverse the aging process of the implant surface. Actually, you have more protein absorption than the new surface that was just made. So this was the first effect. So we have more protein absorption and uh, the second effect is you get, because you have more protein absorption, you have also osteoblastic, more osteoblastic attachment and spreading. So the, oste the osteoblastic attachment and spreading is affected by different implant surfaces and biological aging decreases the number of attached osteoblasts by 50% and therefore it delays the osteoblastic spread. So if you have an A titanium surface, you have uh, less osteoblasts attached to the surface and therefore you have less osteoblastic spread by default. So UVC, the second effect of UVC, it increases the hydrophilicity electrostatic status and therefore it increases the formation of focal adhesion complexes at the surface of our implant. So you have more osteoblastic attachment, more spreading. And since I have more protein absorption, more osteoblastic attachment and spreading, then I also have more osteoblastic differentiation and mineralization. So UVC, which is the absorption of proteins, adhesion and proliferation of my cells, and therefore it is the differentiated the number of differentiated cells from the implant surface, and there is an increase also in the matrix, uh, uh, matrix deposition and the mineralization process of my cells. So basically, these are all indirect processes 
just because I just took the of the implant, now I have an indirect massive effect on the cellular action of the body. So now someone will tell me, okay, just be tapping, what is the of the blood attraction of the blood 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 of the on my implant. So now we're going to this. Okay, take a photo for the on the implant post integration. This is what we care about. A lot of people don't care, they don't care about cells. So first of all, your implant from a bio inner surface now it became bioactive because it is not just doing nothing, doing no harm, no, no good or no bad. No, actually it is now it's using um uh, first of all it has contact with the unit and it has a direct effect um, or an indirect effect on cellular proliferation. So, uh, what is contact of the It is the uh, removal of formation on the implant surface. So, instead of the implant being formed only from the coming from the bone surface to the implant surface, like this, now I have bone coming from both sides. It is actually forming from the implant surface as well. So, now they will meet at half time. So, now we have quicker of integration as well because it forms on both sides and they meet in the middle. And now we even have more implant uh, bone to implant uh, contact but we're coming to this so now from a bio unit to a bioactive what is the second effect i have more bic from 55 percent guess the number i'm going to give you three seconds three two one wrong it is 98 percent the bone to implant contact on my surface from 55 percent it becomes actually it's not even 98 it's 98.2 to be more accurate you have a 98 almost full coverage of blood contact to my implant surface. So the third effect, actually the third and the fourth ones, are first of all the strength and the speed. So the strength is multiplied by three. You have an increased implant stability quotient, you have an increased push in values. That means you have an enhanced primary stability even in implants without cortical bone support. I don't have to do a bicortical support. You have weak bone and you photofunctionalize your implant. We guarantee that we have a triple strength of the implant here. It needs um, uh, better, um, uh, a better primary stability. Yeah? And then there's the speed as well, which is one of the main concerns, not only for the, uh, the, the character only, but not only for the patient, but also for the dentist. A lot of patients, they ask, they want the speed. I don't want to wait for three, four, five months to, um, uh, to place a new my loading, for example. So the speed is multiplied by C, imagine that. So the normal speed of water integration is multiplied by this process is three times faster, which means quicker healing and stability. And there is a little difference between the speed of water integration and the actual clinical speed of healing, I'm going to tell you now. But actually, the speed of water integration is multiplied by three, as um, uh, Ogawa and Colby, they did a few studies about this, and we found that all these actually happen when you just apply this easy light to the implant surface for a few minutes before you put it. So you have a bioactive surface, you have more, more implant contact, you have more speed of integration, and you have a more strength, more strength and more speed of integration. If you try to translate this to in a clinical point of view, in more clinical benefits, uh, let's see how would this directly affect me. First of all, you have a reduced it reduces the average healing time by half. Um, instead of four months, you can load uh, in two. Instead of three, you can load in one and a half, um, according to Aita and colleagues. So we have quicker loading protocols. We have decreased overall treatment time. And we have happier patients, of course. Uh, the second thing is elimination of the stability dip. And we know that we have, uh, when, once we put an implant, uh, the stability, I'm going to explain it now, we have a better and more predictable treatment outcomes once we eliminate this stability dip. So what's a stability dip? Just a quick recap. I'm sure most of these clin uh, the clinicians, they know it, but just a quick recap for everyone. It's the weakest stability point throughout the healing period. Basically, it's the point where the primary stability and the second stability meets. It occurs typically after three weeks following implant placement due to the turnover, the remodeling of the, uh, the bone. You know, they have, they have osteoclast, osteoblast, bone um, uh, deposition, and bone uh, remodeling. I mean, uh, so 
basically, if you want to put this in a graph, you have primary stability and you have secondary stability. Primary stability, the stability, the mechanical one, once you put your implant in the bone, in, inside the bone, the mechanical stability is the primary stability. Once we have this remodeling action happening, this will start going down and um, the secondary stability, aka the also integration process, uh, starts going up from day zero, uh, starts going up. Where do they meet? They meet in the somewhere between the third and the fourth week, which is the weakest point. And sometimes this is the point where the patients get too confident and they start biting on this particular TV, early loading. Uh, it is a dangerous um, period. Um, some uh, clinicians, they said this is more theoretical, but still, it is clinically, you should clinically take care of, at, uh, of your implants at this period. But anyhow, the source of stability is decreasing um, dramatically at this period. So we have this stability dip. So this is the stability dip. Once you do photo functionalization uh, for any implant surface, um, uh, of Rao and Prince, they did a few, um, they published a few articles that the stability dip actually decreases significantly. Now you almost don't have, you have a dip, but it's not like as deep or deep as the original one. They tried it on um, high, implants with high primary stability, and they found that, you know what, you also decrease your dip, and they tried to also implant with lower primary stability, uh, like very bad primary stability, and they discovered that, you know what, even in these uh, type of, types of implants, um, you have much more stability, much more total stability, and you almost eliminated this stability dip. So that's well, that's one of the things that you decrease. Once you eliminate this stability dip, you you decrease your uh, you have more predictability, more success predictability, and you decrease your failure um, chances uh, once you put your implants, especially in early loading situations. So one of the more other clinical uses of this, the use of smaller and shorter implants in more complex cases with higher space or load requirements. Of course, by this time I'm giving this lecture, there are many, many articles published about short implants and about the, the success rate and the predictability of short implants. But now even uh, for the people who are not using them, you can use it and you can guarantee that you have much better primary stability, however short is the implant, and uh, better success rate uh, in complicated cases and killing bones and cases where I have to do a, a time strip. All these cases, I know that I have more predictability for my short implants and I can put them um, comfortably and sleep comfortably at night. So that's one more thing. So now I have better load and mechanical stress distribution as well, because I have better primary stability, I have less stability dip. I have more um, mechanical and load distribution. You have less more resorption once you do this at Ogawa again. Most of these uh, photo personalization answers were published by Ogawa and colleagues, and I definitely the father of this technique. Uh, so we have less bone, Resulting. And this is also very important. One of the main causes of early implant failure is infection. And infection due to any sort of bacteria came, I don't know, somewhere from outside to inside. There is a communication, the flap was not well. Um, uh, the, maybe the technique there was, it was the hygiene. I don't know. So one of the main failures that people um, actually try to avoid is try, try to avoid infections early infections you know that once the implant is also integrated and the flap is closed then you are on, on a relatively safer side so um photo functionalized surfaces they have less bacterial biomass they have less area covered by bacterial biofilm that means you have a less risk of implant infection and failure especially in the first six hours the first few six hours um this is the, the, the time frame where we are afraid of um, uh, the, the implant surface being infected. But once you pass this zone, then the area will become relatively close. So basically what happens is due to this increased hydrophilicity and increased, the, the whole procedure come, becomes very quick. Uh, basically it's a race between bacteria and the regular inflammatory bone cells. So the, the osteointegration procedure initiates so quickly before um, any external bacteria starts infecting the surface, okay? So basically you have an elimination of this time limit of bacterial infection. And you have much more, much less bacterial biofilm attachment, you have less bacterial infection, you have a more predictable implant placement. 
So um, can we use it in other applications? Yes, of course, orthodontic mini screws are also titanium. I can do the same thing. Um, uh, they did some articles, some research on this. They found that they have an increased anchorage and they have also a decreased displacement and the lateral tipping forces because you still have, looking at the same concept here, you have a better primary stability as well. Um, can I use it in titanium mist if I want to do a bone graft, for example? Why not? If I can photo functionalize my titanium mist and I can guarantee better cellular response and better cellular growth, why not? It's also titanium. It did the same effect. Increase osteoconductivity and increase bone regeneration. Does it work for other materials? What I, can, can I use it in chrome cobalt, for example? Yes, I can. Um, there is a few research. You can use it in chrome cobalt. And for zirconium lovers, they will ask me, can I do it? Yes, you can as well. They also did a few researches on this. And actually, you have similar um, effect on these materials just by, again, just saying it, just by applying UV light to your surface for just a few minutes. You have all these effects. So that's all about photo functionalization. Just a quick recap implants undergo biological aging in general. The age is not age, the age of the capabilities over time. So, photo functionalization increases the stability, increases the success rate, and increases the healing time. It is easy to apply, it reduces the mobility, improves the outcome of the predictability, and avoids the situation. And it has different indications you can use different uh, implants for different situations with more predictability. That was about photo functionalization. I think I'm running out of time. Yes, we can have some good time. So, um, so now we know what's of the reason and what's by the area and what's the and it's full tool functionality. So let's look at more of integration. Can I have even more of integration? Yes, I can. How, how can I do this? Um, by teaching you and degenerative medicine. So um, uh, these things are different terms, I'm sure. So there is a combination of self and reading and different chemical, uh, different biomaterials. To enhance these biological effects, uh, give a push to the cells to increase or stimulate them. To um, uh, you don't think the function of the cells, of course, you just give them like a, it's a, a stimulus, so to have a more effect. This uh, actually you can manipulate using tissue engineering techniques and regenerative medicine, and in our case, we call it regenerative dentistry. So you can be, be, be these techniques or these. Um, advances are used in many things, um, uh, in medicine and in dentistry and tissue plantation, using stem cells, using nanoparticles. Uh, in our case here, um, we can use nanotechnology, which is part of this as well. So I want to concentrate on this part of um, this term, okay? The T-E-R-M, so the nanotechnology part. Um, this is one of the ways that we actually uh, enhance our OSI integration. So talking about nanoparticles in general, uh, nanomaterials that they have unique sizes, unique colors, unique shapes, and unique functions according to all these things, okay? Um, uh, they're very useful in uh, many medical fields. And as I told you, you can have different shapes. They just attach and they form different shapes and they have um, different, they are, oh, they can also be made from different materials. You can have gold, you can have silver, you can have even magnets, nanoparticle magnets, different nanomaterials. And uh, of course, you have different sizes of the same nanomaterials. But the only thing is, in order for you to call it a nanomaterial, it must be from zero to 100 nanometer. So of course not zero, it's nothing. So anything above zero or up to 100 is a nanometer. So uh, according to the sizes, according to the shape and the type of material, you can have different functions and different effects on and different cellular rep responses as well. Out of this, we also have gold nanoparticles. These gold, gold nanoparticles are unique. They have unique physical and chemical properties, and they are highly biocompatible. So they are uh, also used in different fields because of these uh, features and biocompatibility. But the thing is, when people think about gold nanoparticles, many of my friends, when I told them, OK, you know what, we are using gold nanoparticles, they think of this. They think of this. And I have to explain to them, no, it doesn't look like this. It's not even golden, by the way. Um, actually, it looks more like a boring pinkish fluid 
It is expensive also, but <laughs> <laughs> actually these are gold nanoparticles. So these gold nanoparticles, they have, according to the size of the nanoparticle itself, you have different variations, but to the same color, like, like a pinkish red, purplish red, orangish color like this. So different sizes, you have different um, hues of the color. But anyhow, it looks like this. So the gold nanoparticles, one of their properties, they go inside the in between the tissues and it's not only in between the tissue they have the capability of getting inside the cells themselves and causing an effect inside uh, or a cellular response inside the cell itself um, if you look at the um, transmission electron microscopy they look like this it's like small nanoparticles <laughs> okay um, so that is this at the bottom of the we decided to use and we decided to test for infusion because of these capabilities or these properties, we were thinking, you know what, they can go inside the cell, they can cause an effect, uh, let's try this uh, on uh, open integration. And there was a previous article um, talking about this. So we decided to do the following. Uh, first of all, we had to actually teach the surface because why we had to actually teach the surface. You know that most of our implants now are acid uh, X, um, or at least they have a rough surface. Uh, because rough surface, this is by the way an actual picture from our research is a rough implant surface, it looks like this. Uh, why do we use the rough surface? Because first of all, the, it facilitates the migration of osteogenic cells, it facilitates the contact osteogenesis on the surface. So the migration of these cells on the titanium surface, so it initiates my uh, contact osteogenesis. The second thing it is in earlier and greater bone to implant contact because of facilitating the osteogenesis process, okay? So it increased also the bone anchoring and removal force, so I have better primary stability and uh, better removal force, uh, more stability in general. So that's why you had to, um, as it is, we needed the rough surface, we did this. Then what we did is we used different things to try to increase or enhance our integration. You used SBF, BMPs, MSCs, UV light, whatever. What are these? SBF is serum body fluids. MSCs are the mesenchymal stem cells. And we just combined all these into different groups, like three groups, one with um, one with gold, one with just SBF, and one with um, gold nanoparticle and SBF, and one with nothing. Of course, it had the cells inside. And the same group, yes, we did UV functionalization just to compare between the effects of UV photo-functionalized um, surfaces and the other ones. So um, getting back to um, SBF, I want to just give a quick idea about what is this. Uh, basically, uh, it's a solution. It has an ion concentration which mimics, so it's a, the human blood plasma. So basically, my surface become a biomimetic um, surface. Uh, it's a, the bone bones, it, it, uh, it pulls my cells. The cells, when they come and see, they don't just see uh, a, a blank metal. They found uh, metal, but they found it covered with a layer of hydroxyapatite crystal. So it looks more bony. So it is more um, user friendly, you can say. <laughs> so basically, what happens is when you put this stimulated body fluid with the same concentration of ions as the one, in our plasma, uh, calcium and phosphate ions participate and uh, cause continuous growth of the appetite with um, similar molecular structure to the bone. So, we have what we call a hydroxy appetite um, layer covering. What happens is, what this do is we have uh, now an increase in osteoconductivity and better osteointegration. Okay? So, if you look at our surface, um, if we, after we did this, and uh, we did our um, um, uh, scanning electron microscopy, and we looked at the surface, this is a normal one I showed you once, it's a normal surface. So just concentrate on this surface and concentrate on the one I'm gonna bring next, which is covered by hydroxyapatite crystals. Look at this, it's more bony, it's white. This is the normal one. And this is the one is covered with hydroxyapatite crystals. It is more bony like. Now we have uh, more osteoconductivity. We have um, the bone starts growing on the implant surface as well. And it means the normal bone growth is coming from far away. And uh, if you look at the cellular differentiation at the same surface, and to tell you the truth, uh, I put this picture, I was going to change it, but you know what? I said, I'm gonna keep it. This is one of the pictures, but then I realized this is a photo functionalized one. 
And this is the second day after photofunctionalization, we found many cells start differentiating and attaching to the surface. But anyhow, this is the, the same um, uh, one covered with um, serum body fluids. And this is one of the cells looking from nearby, it's a closer image. Um, uh, so, look at this toast. When I was doing this slide, I was actually eating a toast, so I decided to put a toast. So if we have osteoconductivity, which is a good thing, um, can I can I do something and make it and make my surface more more better? Is there such a thing called more better? No, a better surface. Can I make it also inductive instead of also conductive? What is the difference between also conductivity and also inductivity? Uh, also conductive surface acts as a scaffold, which is a place a nice place for cells to come and attach and spread on. And also inductive surface it actually. It recruits the cells. It is active in recruiting the cells to come and attach to it. So um, it is uh, it is not inert. It is more active. So it simulates these cells to develop into pre osteoblasts So it has an, a, a positive effect on cellular differentiation and cellular attachment. And all the things. Basically, as an osteoinductive surface, it induces osteogenesis. It is not just a dull bioinert surface. So we were thinking, you know what? So now we have a good surface. It's uh, acid itch. It is um, uh, high covered with hydroxy appetite layer. Um, can we make it more, um, uh, can we make it more positive inductive? Let's try to do um, uh, the, the gold nanoparticles. So before just we go to the gold nanoparticle part, I'm gonna give you a, a quick um, thing about mesenchymal stem cells that we are using because we wanted to see the effect on all these things on the stem cells to start giving us the pre osteoblast and then started forming the osteoblast because it, this what happens in the normal situation, these mesenchymal stem cells, they, they are the, um, like the fathers of these osteoblasts and then they, which they become osteocytes and everything else. So these are mesenchymal stem cells in general. The ones we use here, by the way, were um, uh, bone marrow stem cells from rats. So these stem cells are self-renewing. They are very promising in tissue engineering um, applications. They are... Um, and the abundance of these cells and their ability to suppress the immune response, they simulate the bone regeneration and makes it more, it's better, like more influential in the also integration process. So if you have an MFC, uh, kind of stem cell, these cells are actually multipotent. What does this mean? They can differentiate into different types of cells. Chondrocytes, they can become myocytes, they can become adipocytes, and in our situation, they become most to black. They are multipotent, uh, which is a good thing because this is the basic step in promoting um, regeneration in general. So we got this, we got the, um, now we know that our body, uh, the serum body fluid, and the acid fixing, or the roughness um, effect maybe. And lastly, I want to talk about the gold nanoparticle effect on, so we have something here. I don't know how to pick it up. Okay, and lastly, the, I got questions in front of me. Um, uh, I'm gonna talk about gold nanoparticles. So gold nanoparticles, um, they have a direct effect inside the cell, right? like a cellular effect. And what we did is we got um, small ones because one of the guys, um, one of the researchers, I think Jan and colleagues, they tried 40 nanometers, they tried 20 nanometers um, gold nanoparticles, and the conclusion is size matters. Like the smaller, they found the smaller ones, they have better effect and uh, they simulate more tissue regeneration. Uh, they have a more effect on more cellular effect so we thought you know what since size matters why don't we use small ones smaller ones they use 20. Um, we're going to use 10. so we got 10 nanometer gold nanoparticles and what we did and then we just followed the process these 10 nanometer gold nanoparticles they get engulfed or they get um, phagocytosed by the cells so they go inside the cell and what happened is they they just threw these small vesicles they go and they mechanically activate the P38 MAP kinase pathway, which is gives a signal um, due to the time. I cannot explain all these molecular things. Okay, I have time limitations in here, but uh, all of these things are actually uh, mentioned in one of the articles. I'm gonna mention it uh, in the last slide, I think. So they activate the MAP kinase pathway, which activate the um, uh, RUNX2 gene. Um, it gives a signal to this gene, and this gene actually the main gene responsible for directing and enhancing osteogenic differentiation of mesenchymal stem cells into osteoprogenitor cells. It's the main thing that makes this stem cell an osteoblast. 
basically. So then the cascade of events or the chain of events will start from activation of this gene, which is, so now we're talking about a, a, a DNA level, a genetic level, okay? So this gene will um, activate, start this event of um, uh, uh, the chain of events, and uh, the cells become osteoprogenitor cells, and then we have other genes here, of, um, osteopontin, collagen one. Uh, these are all osteogenic biomarkers, which means we, if we see this, we know that this cell is actually growing healthily into uh, becoming an osteoblast. Okay, so we have collagen type one, osteopontin, osteocalcin, and alkaline phosphatase as well, which are also, they are, it's not specific to um, uh, osteogenic growth, but alkaline phosphatase is a good biomarker for uh, differentiation. I mean, it's the initiation of the whole thing with mineralization and everything. Okay, so these are biogenic, um, uh, osteogenic biomarkers that we are looking at because we cannot, we are not looking at inside the cell itself, actually. What, if you want to know how much is, how much fire is going inside a house, you cannot go inside the fire, you just see how much smoke is coming out. So we are looking at these osteogenic biomarkers. So anyhow, the Arenox 2 gene, it starts with, um, uh, the, uh, the whole this activation process becomes osteoprogenitor cells, which becomes pre osteoblasts. Uh, we also have osteogenic biomarkers in the um, way, and then this becomes mature osteoblasts. And we were also looking at osteocalcin and osteopontin. So basically, what happens is we have um, a cellular uptake. This is the event that's happening cellular uptake, binding to sap to plasma proteins, inducing the expression of osteoblastic specific genes, enhancing bone regeneration. And then, therefore, we have faster implant osteocrit, faster differentiation of these cells, and therefore faster implant osteointegration and better primary stability. And we have also increased osteoconductivity. And according to Gang et al. as well, and according to me as well. <laughs> okay. So um, our results uh, came up like this. Uh, we did many tests. We did uh, optical cell density, how many cells after um, like uh, how many like the increase in number the growth of cells and we found we are just looking at 3b by the way we are looking at 3b here 3b is our um, our test group and uh, against the other groups so 3b it has gold nanoparticle had everything gold nanoparticle photo functionalized uh, photo functionalized uv photo functionalized and it was acid each and of course it had the acid and body fluids so look at how high this in here there's a mouse here and the number of cells. We also looked at the site toxicity with the live dead XA, the number of live cells against dead cells. Is it if this approach cytotoxic or not? And actually, we had more live cells. And we actually, one of our um, in 3B here again, we have much more live cells, even although, even by proportion. I mean, it's just not, not just the number of cells, it's also the percentage of dead cells because we have more growing cells. The, 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 the rate of growth is faster than the rate of death in here. So more cells, more live cells on this, doing this approach. We're looking at confocal microscopies and uh, we see the one on the right, the lower right side here is our group against the normal implants. If there is no uh, surface modification, look at the number of red here, the cytotoxicity. The red is dead, green is alive. Here we have much more live cells. And here is the cytoskeletal development. You can see the acting development and and uh, uh, just just if you compare by, by, by the shape and the number here, this is just black. And this is our group here, much more cytoskeletal development uh, when we did this approach or cytoskeletal maturations, we look at the actin and nicolene optical density. Again, 3B, it has the much higher um, protein um, expression. And uh, if you look at the cells, when we look at um, the, um, uh, the electron scanning microscopy or the scanning electron microscopy, we saw this in front of us after 24 hours. We did this after 24 hours of feeding our cells. Look at the differentiation of this almost of full reloaded osteoblast. You can see the, um, you can appreciate the site of clinical distribution and the growth in general. So this is the photo personalized um, uh, nanoparticle treated uh, uh, cell. 
And we looked at all these units for tensile like in one spot. Again, it's the highest really. Um, all of the plotting is the highest. Um, alkaline all the cap in the highest. We did an alkaline for space. We got much more alkaline for space. Uh, expecting to more differentiation, more regulation of the, the whole procedure and even the mineralization process is much higher when you do this. And this actually, ladies and gentlemen, what is called super ocean integration. This thing was, um, was um, uh, proposed by uh, Takahiro Gao, who used the UV photofoxinalization. But in our case, we did a more super ocean integration than just using the UV light alone. And uh, just a few months ago, and we, of course, we published it in the self proposed by Sevier, and it was also cited by a few companies, uh, protein companies. And uh, just this year, by the way, in a systematic review, it was um, published that it is out of, I don't know, 550 articles of people using these technologies. Um, ours, the one in the middle, had the highest optical density up to date. So using the 10 nanometer corner particles was the part that we have the fastest recorded uh, or the most number of cells, uh, cellular differentiation and cellular growth up to date. So the conclusion of this thing is um, more dentists are placing implants these days. Most implant failures occur due to an osteointegration defect. And if we reverse that, we can reverse the biological aging of the, our implant, we enhance our implant properties and the surface. Ah, and also the nanotechnology gives us, gives us uh, more osteoinductive properties. I cannot say my implant is fully osteoinductive, but it has osteoinductive properties. So uh, we have less complications, less healing time, and better predictability and success rates are more achievable. Can we achieve super osseointegration? integration? Yes, we can. And by this, I think, do I have anything else? I think I concluded my, my um, thing, the lecture here, the webinar. And um, this is me doing my thing, looking at myself back in the days in China. That was in Wuhan. I promise you guys, I did not, I did not have any relation with this coronavirus. <laughs> I was just doing my bone cells. And this is my email, so um, I am happy to receive any questions, any advices, anything about uh, regarding these technologies. And thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much for everyone who was watching and everyone in the AIM Academy.